Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, oh, thou of God and man, the Son, thee will I cherish, Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. Fair are the meadows, fairer still the woodlands, robed in the blooming garb Spring. Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the woeful heart to sing. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be
stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who came to the Father are restored, and the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit in the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. friends, and thank you for connecting with us here at Russia Gordon's Church on this Sunday, June the 17th. Uh, it's hard to believe, but this is now the 14th consecutive week that we have been operating with some combination of online and or uh, drive-in worship services, which when all this started, I'm not sure if any of us expected to go on this long. Do you? Folks, it is an interesting time to be the church in our world. And so we would just ask, actually, that you would pray for your church leaders who are trying to respond to the new realities that are sparked by this pandemic uh, in a way that's both responsible and yet still in line with the mission that God has given to us. And also to be patient with us as we try to navigate these uncertain times together. It's certainly not the easiest thing to do, but God has called us to it and he will enable us for it. As we look into God's word here today, we're gonna to be going back again to the second chapter of the book of Acts, which is where we've spent the past couple of Sundays actually. And, and for the sake of those who may not have connected with us for the earlier messages, the passage that we're gonna be looking at this, uh, this time around comes right on the heels of the event that the Bible calls Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost was when God sent his Holy Spirit into the world in order to enable his people to continue on in the work that Jesus started with them before his death and resurrection, and then ascension back into heaven. And if you're not familiar with how that all went down, uh, you, you should really go back and read it for yourself sometime, because there's some pretty wild stuff in there, actually. Uh, there's a, a windstorm, and maybe if you've caught it, some of our past messages, you would have heard some of this. There's a windstorm that happens, or at least something that sounded like a windstorm that fills the house where the disciples were staying. And then there's something that gets referred to as tongues of fire that start appearing everywhere. And the disciples are talking in one language, but all of the people who are flocking to see what's going on are hearing what they're saying in their own languages, which, you know, that's kind of uh, hard to imagine ourselves or get our, our minds around ourselves. It's saying something, right? It, I mean, even Google Translate hasn't figured out how to do that yet. It, it, was, a, it, was, it was a party that was going. It's a full-on first century phenomenon that's going on here. And for a lot of people who showed up at uh, the event, because of all the things that were going on, it required a bit of an explanation for them to understand what was happening. And of course, not everybody gets it in the end anyway. But after the Apostle Peter gives it his kind of his best effort and tells everyone who was gathered around there all about how it was really about Jesus and about, uh, about Jesus being the gateway to a relationship with God the Father, and this was enabling ministry in Jesus' name, we're told that 3,000 people believed him that day, and they were baptized. And from a historical perspective, you might find this interesting to know, this is the moment that the church really started. Until that moment, Jesus had some followers, and the groundwork for a Christian movement had been kind of growing. It had been laid from the foundation of the world, actually. But the starting point for the Christian church, in actual fact, really didn't come into view 
until Jesus died, rose again from the dead, and went back to heaven, and then the Holy Spirit came to fill his people and enable them to be Jesus' hands and his feet in a world that needed to hear the truth of who he is. This, this is the birthing moment of the church. And so in the passage that we're going to be looking at here today, what's really being described for us here is the church in its infancy. And what I love about it, I'll just tell you this up front, is that as an infant church, this is a picture of it before it got cluttered up by, you know, 2,000 years of history and tradition and cultural appropriation and structures and programs, including, you know, all of, their, uh, all of our unspoken rules about how we need to dress and where we should meet and how we should behave and when we stand and when we sit and all of those things, all the stuff that, you know, some of us church kids grew up in, uh, up with over the years. And, uh, you know, we have a number of things that a lot of us could think about the, the way that we grew up for those of us who did grow up in church, all the things that we found that were traditions there. And, and, and don't fool yourself that someday uh, our emerging generations are going to have things that they would add to the list. They probably already know what they are. But the point is that we all have this idea of what we think church is supposed to look like that is based largely on our own experience. And for some people, that can be good. And for other people, let's be honest, it's not so good. But there wasn't any of that when the church was being established in the first century here in Acts 2. It was a blank slate. And they had to, what they had to go on, all they had to go on was the teaching of Jesus and the counsel of this new Holy Spirit presence and the need for 3,000 people to come together to accomplish the mission that God wanted them to accomplish. And I think that in particular, in this day, when, when, a, when a global pandemic has us all missing our own version of church as we've known it in the past, and, and maybe wondering what church might look like in the future, in this day, when we're asking ourselves questions related to essentials and non-essentials and what we need to prioritize and how we should allocate our resources and all of those things, is there really any better time to be going back and just being reminded again of what the purpose was for the church of God in Christ from the very beginning? Like, I'm not suggesting that it's going to answer all of our questions for us. There are a lot of things that we're going to have to wrestle through, and it's all going to take some time, and it's going to take some patience, as I've mentioned before. But this is as good a time as any, I believe, to at least start out by reminding ourselves of what was critical to the early church so that we don't get so caught up in the minor things, that we miss the bigger, more missional aspects of what it means to be the church in our rapidly changing context. And so if you wanna follow along, this is what it says in Acts 2, and starting with verse 42. And keep in mind, the church had just grown from maybe a few hundred at most to now several thousand in a single day. And so this is a movement that was, it's born of necessity, actually. They didn't have time to map it out entirely. Some of it just happened naturally, I'm sure. But as a newly formed church, the Bible teaches us in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, that all the believers, I'm reading from the scriptures now, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property, possessions, and shared money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And then it finishes up by saying, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. In other words, it was an active and growing movement of God. And like I said, it's a great picture of the church, the way it was when it was first getting started, the church as it was in the beginning. And while I've seen lots of different approaches to this passage over the years, in the time that we have left, all I'd really like to do is just highlight not so much what they actually did, but more the core values that inspired or informed what they did. So that we can be thinking about those same core values as we consider the approach that we take as the church in our own day and age. And so if you wanna keep track, there are at least five 
core values that I think we can identify in the text, uh, of which we're only going to touch on a couple this morning. We'll save the others for another time. But the first one I'd like for us to notice in Acts chapter 2 is this. It's the core value of commitment. It's just commitment. Verse 42 says that the believers committed themselves to all these different things that are really mostly still a part of church life today, or until recently at least. They committed themselves to being taught the Word and to fellowship and to communal meals and the Lord's Supper and prayer. And at another time, we can and should talk about all those specific things specific things that they committed themselves to. But for our purposes here today, I really just want to focus on the core value of commitment itself. Because make no mistake about it, in the early church, it took commitment to follow Jesus with other people. And I say that because, don't forget, they were only a few weeks removed at this point from the crucifixion of Jesus. And so that crucifixion was still big news in Jerusalem. Like, for the three years leading up to that point, Jesus had been teaching, and he'd been healing and creating a buzz everywhere he went that was drawing large crowds of people, which shouldn't really be a surprise to anybody because Jesus has always been attractive to people. His love for them is so pure. But what was attractive to him, uh, attractive rather about him to the general population, was interpreted as intimidation and threat to some of the civil and religious authorities of that day in particular. And so, you know what happened. They arrested Jesus on made-up charges that everyone knew he was innocent of, and, and they put him on trial unfairly, and they beat him mercilessly to, take, to sort of make an example out of him, and they humiliated him in an attempt to, to bring him into disrepute. And in the end, after they'd done all of the rest of it, they nailed him to a cross and made him suffer publicly until his last breath was spent. And while those who believed in Jesus did so because they knew that he overcame death and vacated the sealed tomb that he was laid in, they'd come to believe that. Still, it's not like the spectacle, the authorities of Jesus, the, that the authorities of Jesus made, on, uh, uh, or the authorities made about Jesus was lost on them. Like they got the message they were, they were trying to deliver. They were affected by it. They knew and believed that the same authorities who crucified Jesus could do the same to them. And so when we read in Acts about how those who believe committed themselves to all those things that, that were listed there in the scriptures, all the things they committed themselves to, just know this, it wasn't an easy commitment to make. Like it came with real risk. It came with sacrifice. To believe in Jesus quietly and privately all by yourself in your own home, that'd be one thing. But look at the list again of some of the things that they committed themselves to and you'll see that it was all about Christian community. They made a commitment to one another in order to honor God and all the things they did together as church. It's part of the design. And as we think about that in our own day and age, when church is so different and we're rethinking and reworking and in some cases reinventing some of the things that we actually do to fulfill Jesus' mission, that core value of commitment is still a critical one. Because there are still people who need to know Jesus in our world who, not, who don't yet know him. And the primary way that God has chosen to share Jesus with people is through the local church. Whether our building is open or closed, whether our worship is in person or online, whether our outreach is hand-to-hand -hand or at a distance somehow, our commitment to it is critical. And so that's the first core value from the early church that I wanted to point out here today. And the second one, and this is the only other one that we're going we're gonna to look at this time around. We'll save the others for another week. The second one, though, is this. It's the core value of awe and wonder. Uh, A-W-E, awe and wonder. Verse 43 says that a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And someone might say, well, that seems a little weird as a core value. Like, I get it as part of the experience of church, but as a core value, it seems a little strange because you can't just drum up awe and wonder. Like, you either get excited about something or you don't, right? I know some of you have heard our family's big nickel story from me before, how back a number of years ago, uh, we decided to drive through northern Ontario to my sister's place in Sioux Lookout, which is almost to Manitoba, and so it wasn't a short drive. And along the way, I made the decision 
that we were going to make a stop in Sudbury to see the big nickel. Not everybody was in, in involved with that decision making. I kind of made it on my own. And Wendy hadn't seen it before, and I'd seen it a number of times as a kid. So I thought it was kind of a must-see attraction along the way. And so we did it. It wasn't exactly right on the route, and admittedly, it didn't fit well into our trip as far as timing was concerned. But we made all the allowances that needed to make, we, we needed to make in order to make it happen. And after we'd been there a few minutes and, and taken the ob, uh, sort of the obligatory pictures that needed to be taken, we all got back into the vehicle. And as we're driving away, Wendy looks at me and says, okay, we did that. And I'm not ungrateful, but I just want you to know for future reference that as far as the big nickel is concerned, I have seen it now and I'm not ever going to feel the need to see it again. I mean, I still don't quite understand it. What's not to like about a 30 foot nickel? Like that's impressive. But for her, it wasn't something that she was awestruck by. And see, that's what some people would say about making awe and wonder a core value in the church. Awe and wonder just happen when it happens. You can't just make it part of the shared experience. But here's what I want to say about that. Aren't there enough things about our God and what he's done for us already to be awed and wonderstruck about? I mean, isn't it awesome that God created us the way that he created us and created the world the way he created? Isn't it isn't it awesome that he breathed into us the breath of life and placed us on the planet as living, loving, reasoning, intelligent beings? Isn't it awesome that when we broke things and made a mess, that God had a plan already in place to restore what we'd broken and re reintroduce us to a relationship with God? Like, think about Jesus. Isn't it awesome that he lived and died and rose again from the grave and that we're the beneficiaries of that? You know, far too often in churches, we can get so caught up in just doing the things that we do and meeting with the people we meet and singing the songs we sing and praying the prayers that we pray. And some of us have been at it so long and have seen it so often and have just been on this journey for such a long time that there is a tendency to become, can I say it, maybe bored with it? Like it's worn us down. The routines have just become routines. And we've lost somehow, and somewhere along the line, lost that sense of awe that we had in the beginning. Well, in a world where so many of our routines have been shaken up now and our regular patterns have been disrupted by a disease that we didn't ask for or want, maybe one of the things that God is giving us space for in this moment is to go back to the things that got us excited about the church in the first place. The fact that we get to be the family of God and the body of Christ, and the community of the Holy Spirit, taking the awesome and wonderful love of a Savior to a world that needs that love as much now as ever before. And so I, I want you to just consider that today. And we're going to be, we're not quite done with this passage. We're going to be coming back to it another time. But for this week, just know that my prayer for us is centered around two things, that we would be fully and wholeheartedly committed to God through the family that is our local church, that we would make that a core value. And secondly, that another core value would be to continually stand in the glory of God and remind ourselves of all the awesome things that he's done for us so that we can more capably, more ably communicate the, that truth and the, that mission to the people around us and fulfill uh, what God has called us to do. And may the Lord himself be pleased to witness, with it, uh, witness it with us as we do. God bless you today. Uh, have a great rest of your Sunday and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for coming.